If we take a look at the Christian world around us, basically everybody in the world that uh, claims to be a Christian, we will discover that there are hundreds of different denominations that can uh, be further divided into thousands of different perspectives and probably millions of variations even within those perspectives. And uh, for hundreds of years now, people <clears throat> have been debating all these various ideas. And especially now that we have the internet and social media, you find Christians going back and forth every day and every night, uh, trying to determine which particular version or belief system is the correct one. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> all this is happening within Christian circles, but of course you have an entire world of different religions out there. Uh, other monotheist religions like Islam, uh, polytheistic religions like Hinduism, there are supernatural believing philosophies, supernaturalist philosophies like Buddhism uh, that don't have a, don't necessarily have a God concept, but still believe in the supernatural. And then you have the naturalists, uh, most modern day atheists would fall under, under that category. So there are all these different belief systems in the world and People see reality in different ways. And even within Christianity, there's many, many different perspectives. So the question then is, why do we have so many beliefs? Why do we have so many religions or points of view? And if Christianity is one religion and it comes from the same source, why are there so many perspectives within Christianity itself? We're going to start by focusing on Christianity and then move on to other um, religions later on in future episodes. Now, when <clears throat> people try to make sense of large bodies of data and complicated bodies of data, the first thing they do is they try to organize it in some way. Uh, they try to sort it out based on some criteria and, to try to, and it helps to make sense of it. So uh, as an example, let's, let's think about your local neighborhood Walmart. Um, if you walk into a Walmart, there are millions of different items of merchandise in that store. And yet, you know, you could look around and say, okay, here's the clothing section, here's the food section, here's the electronics, and here's uh, uh, household items and so on. And if, you, if you're interested in clothes, you can go into the, that, uh, that section of the store and then decide if you want men's, women's, or children. And then you gotta decide if you want <clears throat> Uh, sportswear or casual wear or formal wear and then you can further look for for what you what you need based on on size and, and color and other factors so <clears throat> the store even though it has many many different items it, the fact that it's well organized helps you to find what you're looking for imagine if you got a bunch of people to grab every single piece of merchandise in a walmart and then dump it in the middle of a large warehouse Imagine how difficult shopping would be if you were trying to buy a toaster, for example, and you had to, to dig through this massive pile of merchandise. Uh, if Walmart was running a business like that, they wouldn't be making any money. So organization helps people make sense of large bodies of data. We can handle large bodies of data when we have it sorted out into, into coherent categories. Now, as far as Walmart is concerned, it doesn't matter so much how you organize this as long as it's organized. You know, if one Walmart store has the food on the left and the electronics on the right, and another store has the food on the right and the electronics in the back, it just doesn't matter as long as people know where things are at and how to find them. But in other fields, it does matter how you organize things. And there are more, there's more, than, there's always more than one way to organize them, but there are better ways to organize things. Like for example, in biology, um, <clears throat> You know, you could organize animals by size, you could organize animals by different features, um, you could organize them based on where they live. Uh, but, you know, if you ask a child uh, how they would classify uh, sharks and dolphins, they might say that they're both fish, while a biologist would say, no, the, the sharks are fish, while the, the dolphin is a mammal. And it makes sense to, to categorize these organisms in this way because it tells you a lot more about 
about uh, the dolphin's biology to know that it is a mammal than to simply organize it based on the fact that it looks very similar to a shark. Um, <clears throat> with the, with, as, as science progressed, then we, we started having an understanding of genetics and uh, of DNA. And especially now that we're able to sequence DNA, it has helped us uh, to organize uh, living organisms even better. And it makes a lot of sense to organize these organisms based on uh, the thing that is responsible for the variation between them, which is the genetics. So um, not only are we able to sort them out and to, to make sense of, of large numbers of animals uh, because we, we organize them properly, but we're also able to make predictions in the sense that like, for example, if, uh, if you study the, the genetics of one organism and you realize that it, it's prone to, to certain types of diseases or, or has certain uh, predispositions to something, you could, you could then look across at other uh, animals that are genetically similar and see if the same predispositions exist there as well. So it, it makes sense at times to organize things based on the source of the variety between them. Whereas if you are doing, trying to do this with Walmart, you wouldn't really have a way to organize merchandise based on the <clears throat> source of the variation. There wouldn't be a logical way to do that. Okay, so, so the question then is, when we think of Christian theology, uh, is there a way to organize it that, that makes more sense, that, that gives us further insight than just basic, basically sorting things into categories? Because otherwise, there's many different ways to organize Christian theology. We can, we can organize it by denominations. We can organize it based on whether it's classical or modern. We can organize it based on whether it's liberal or conservative. Um, we can organize it by doctrines. You know, you hear people talk about pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib. That's one way that people classify themselves and their beliefs. But none of this really tell you much beyond just that basic level of organization. <clears throat> so the question is, is there a, an equivalent in theology of what DNA does in biology? Is there a genetic element to Christian theology so that we can organize it based on the source of the variation between the different points of view? And the answer is yes, there, there is a way to do this and it is called epistemology. We can organize theology based on it, on the various epistemologies that are used to arrive at the different uh, theological traditions. <clears throat> now, obviously epistemology is kind of one of those uh, technical words that not everybody's familiar with. So let's just spend a little bit of time talking about what exactly is epistemology. Epistemology is the study of how we know things. Uh, so for example, you know, how do you know that there was a civil war in the United States? How do you know this? Well, <clears throat> maybe your parents told you or your teachers in school or you read about it in books or you've seen movies about it, but uh, is there a way to confirm that, that this is correct? How do, how do you know that your parents knew what they were talking about or your teachers or maybe the books you read, how do you know that they, they, were, they were correct or the movies weren't just fiction? Uh, well, then you got to do further research, you know, you go, you go to college or you talk to historians. Um, so you go back and try to, to figure out what, what sources were used by your teachers or your parents or the books you read to make sure that this is correct. And then if you're still not sure, you could say, well, how did the historians come up with this? Uh, how did they figure this out? And then you could go and look for original documents. Uh, maybe even look, uh, look for archaeological <clears throat> evidence, um, do a, a wide sweep of, of uh, you know, people that, that still live in those areas that were affected by the war and, and try to get down to the history and, and talk to them and see what they heard from their parents and their grandparents and so on. So epistemology has to do with tracing back the, the sources of how we know things and to, to, to determine whether those beliefs are justified, whether we're, we have good reason for believing certain things. 
there's, there's, there are things in the world that are made up, that are fake, that are lies. And we need to find a way to differentiate between truth and lies. Okay, so how does epistemology apply to Christianity? To figure out the difference between different Christian perspectives, we need to look at the sources from where people get those beliefs. And in Christianity, there, there's quite a wide range of different sources that people have used over the centuries. And these include the Bible, they include the church as a whole, as a community, uh, they include the, uh, the individuals being inspired by the Holy Spirit, um, they put Christian tradition, so <clears throat> basically something was passed on from parents to children down the line. They include personal experience with God, they include philosophy, science, culture, and sometimes prophets. Some, some churches have uh, modern prophets that they follow, and so on. So different Christians within the wide worldwide Christian community uh, rely on different sources of authority, and these affect uh, the theology that they end up with. Now, once you identify the sources of authority, the next question is, how do you prioritize them? So, you know, if, if, if there's a particular um, theological tradition that just relies on a single source of authority, that's, that's one thing. But if they have multiple sources of authority, sometimes these sources don't agree with each other. So you have to figure out how to differentiate them. Uh, if there's conflict, which one do you follow first? Which one, which one? Uh, you know, gets, gets preeminence when, when there's disagreement. And then that means that ultimately there's a final arbit arbiter or, or a final, final decider between all these different sources. So that is, you know, you, you, co you, co you consult with one source and then you find a second one and it's slightly different. And then a third one, and then you finally say, okay, uh, I'm going to consult this last source and this one is the one that's going to decide which of the others is correct after all. And once you've established this, so you've established your sources of authority, their, their relative priority, and then the, the final arbiter between all of them, uh, there's always a methodology. And a lot of times the methodology is implied by the sources you're using. So uh, once you determine your sources, it kind of logically tells you what methodology would make sense to follow using those sources. And this basically constitutes the, the epistemology or the, the knowledge base of the different traditions within Christianity, the different theological traditions. Um, I have a graphic where uh, I've listed all the different truth sources or authority sources at the bottom, like, uh, you know, the Bible tradition, philosophy, community, science, and so on. And then I have these buttons that you can move up and down and say, okay, uh, this one has more authority, this one has less authority. And as you move the buttons around, you could imagine uh, creating different types of theology with each arrangement. So if you if you take tradition and you move it up higher to the top and then you put uh, philosophy lower, you will produce a different kind of theology than if you shift them around a different way. Uh, and in general, as long as you know somebody's sources of authority and their final arbiter, you could actually predict what their theology would look like, even if you've never heard of it just based on uh, how those sources would logically work together to, to arrive at some conclusion. So what you end up with then in Christianity is that you have different epistemic models. Um, this, this different perspectives in Christianity, there you could think of them as theological families. Um, they're based on different foundational presuppositions about how we know the things we know about God and the things we know about Christianity in general. So um, one way to think about it is to, to imagine uh, a, a tree right? or a set of trees. So uh, this is an analogy and I'm going to be using a series of analogies coming up, but um, a lot of times, we have the tendency to think of Christianity, if we were going to use the tree as an analogy for Christianity, to think of it as one tree. So, you know, maybe the roots go back to the apostolic era, with, to, to, you know, Jesus coming on earth and, and starting the Christian religion. 
but then it grows into a tree and it has all these different branches going in many different directions. And we think of Christianity that way. But if we were to look at Christianity from an epistemic perspective, it would actually make more sense to think of it as multiple trees because the root systems for all these different Christian traditions are different. The epistemology is different. So if we thought about all the different theologies and philosophies in the world, all the different world religion as a forest, and we came to look for the tree that represents Christianity, we would probably find not one tree, but a collection of trees because they each have their own independent root systems and they, they develop into this uh, constructs, this theological philosophical constructs based on different foundations. And a lot of times um, when you look at uh, different people coming from different traditions, having a conversation, sometimes just like if you have two trees next to each other and the branches can overlap, sometimes people cannot tell because of the similar similarities in what they're saying. They're not, they cannot tell that they're actually, they actually belong to different trees. And even though they sound the same and, and they say things that sound very similar, if you really follow the, the, the source of what they're saying and the root system on which their whole theological uh, tree is, is growing out of, it's a very different system. And this is a source of confusion in Christianity. Um, to use another analogy, think, think uh, of uh, the legal system. Like in the United States, um, you know, if you, if you go to court over something and you don't like the, the judgment that you receive, you could appeal it to a higher court and then you could keep appealing it until it goes all the way out to the Supreme Court. Uh, but when you get to the Supreme Court, that's, that's the final authority. There, there's no further for you to appeal. Whatever the Supreme Court decides, that's the final decision. And the problem is in Christianity, different Christian traditions have a different Supreme Court. So it's almost like, um, it's almost like they're, they're, they're different countries. So the Supreme Court in one country doesn't have authority over the Supreme Court in another country. So, for example, if you have a conversation with a friend and you disagree about some doctrine, you know, maybe, again, you could disagree about the tribulation, whether it's, you know, the rapture is pre trib post trib all those different things that, that people argue about in certain evangelical circles. Um, the first question you should ask yourself is, are we even within the same epistemic tradition? Because if we're not, the conversation is pointless because in the end, the, the Supreme Court or the final authority is going to be different for each one. So again, it's almost like you live in different countries and the Supreme Court in one country doesn't have jurisdiction over the Supreme Court in another country. So if people have these disagreements and they realize that they belong to different epistemic models, what they should do is set aside that specific debate and then go back and try to figure out which which of the models is correct, the, the entire epistemic model itself, not just the specific points that they disagree with. Okay, so let's move on to another analogy for epistemology in Christian theology. Uh, let's try to use a, a building as, as, a, as an analogy to, to bring up a few other points across. So if we picture a building, the building has a certain set of foundations. And the foundations are the epistemology. And on those foundations, we usually start to develop this theological system or this robust logical structure that's built on top of the premises that we start with. And each one of these epistemic models ends up having certain strengths and certain weaknesses. So different, different Christian, Christian traditions have different foundations and they have this different logical structures that are built on top of this foundation. And some of these traditions do better in certain respects and others do better in other respects. They address certain lines of evidence better and have weaknesses in other, regarding other aspects of, of <clears throat> reality. Now, the, one of the things that makes studying or discussing or, or dealing with the situation difficult is the fact that each of us we, we each operate from within one of these um, 
one of these uh, theoretical structures. So picture yourself in this building and you have uh, a disagreement with somebody from a different theological tradition, but you live inside one of these traditions. You're not outside looking at them and saying, this tradition is better than this other tradition. You're actually inside one of them and you're trying to evaluate something that's, that's uh, a whole different a whole different structure that is different than your own. And not only does this create bias in a sense because your entire life revolves around this, this theoretical structure that, that you take for granted as being what reality is like, and you believe this is how things are and, and you live your whole life from within, but it's also hard to evaluate somebody else because they're their building, their theoretical structure that, that they exist in has a different architecture. So you might look at it and say, oh, it this, this building has all these different weaknesses, but you don't realize that it's, it's built very differently. And while those might be weaknesses from within the logic of your system, it's not necessarily a weakness for them. Uh, so it's, it makes it very difficult to really understand and, and, and relate to other people's points of view because their, their entire worldview uh, has a different foundation and a different rationale. Um, so in order to, to really properly evaluate epistemic models, uh, we need the discipline of being able to detach emotionally, so to speak, from, from our own point of view and to, to be able to kind of step step out of it and then look from the outside at the different perspectives and give each one of them the benefit of the doubt long enough, in, long enough to understand where the other people are coming from and to understand the logic of their system and why they view things the way they do. Because otherwise we would never be able to understand them and everybody would be sitting within their own theoretical structure and thinking everybody else is wrong. And there will be no way to, to communicate between, between the different perspectives. Okay, so if we were going to evaluate the different epistemic models now. So we've already established that Christianity is not just one, uh, one massive perspective with, with many variations, but it's in fact, it's actually more similar to, to a collection of different religions within under one umbrella. So we have all these different perspectives in Christianity and the tendency for all of us is to think that one of them is right and the others are wrong and to think in terms of right or wrong. And even if we might not be able to, to establish it for a fact that the perspective we agree with is correct and the others are wrong, we still think that eventually uh, we should be able to prove this or eventually we will have enough evidence to prove that one perspective is right and wrong. Um, the problem is humanity has been at this for, for centuries and millennia. We have been arguing back and forth about religion, about philosophy. Christianity has been around for 2000 years and there's been debates for 2000 years and especially uh, as time progressed the past 100 years and now with technology, the debates just keep increasing. So it, it might be a good time for us to step back and say that maybe we just don't have conclusive proof to, to figure out who's correct and who isn't. Maybe the problem isn't um, with us not, <clears throat> not being uh, sincere enough to, to accept the truth. Maybe the problem is with the limitations of human epistemology. In other words, we have certain tools that we use to determine what truth is and to arrive at correct knowledge, especially in academic circles, because we're, we're talking about this as a, as somewhat of an academic level, but maybe there's a limitation to these tools and we might never be able to, to come to a, a consensus. We might never be able to conclusively demonstrate that one perspective is the correct one and all the others are wrong. So what we probably should start to do instead is to learn to live with simultaneous viable models. So in, in other words, instead of this, uh, deciding that, okay, this is the correct model, all the other ones are wrong, we should rather think, okay, it's possible that several of these models 
are still viable. They, they're still in the game. There's still there's still a possibility that they might actually be correct and make peace with that that way of thinking rather than continue on to have this endless debates as if eventually we're going to be able to prove that somebody is right and all the other people are wrong. So instead of thinking about right and wrong, we should start to think in terms of parameters of viability. Uh, we cannot just wholesale accept every single perspective and say, okay, you know, if we cannot demonstrate that one perspective is correct, that means everybody's correct. We can't do that because otherwise we, we would be accepting a whole lot of nonsense. Um, I mean, I could, I could just make up something on the spot right now and everybody else will be obligated to say, okay, that, must, that perspective must be correct as well. Uh, so we need to figure out how to establish certain parameters of viability and any epistemic model that fits within those parameters would then, uh, would then be considered a viable possibility and, and treated with, 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 the, with the respect and, would, and given, given, the, given room to develop and to grow and to, to continue to build into something more and more well thought out as opposed to just dismissing it and, and, and uh, trying to prove it wrong. Okay, so this video and podcast series is going to be um, concerned with a specific theoretical model with a specific epistemology, and that is going to be the sola scriptura model. And in the introduction, I've explained that it is a, a theological model that has not been worked on yet because either people have redefined Sola Scriptura or they have done it in a way that just simply doesn't work or they've decided that it is impossible to do Sola Scriptura theology so they, they just dismiss it. And the purpose of this uh, <clears throat> series has been to, and it's going to be to explain why, logically speaking, there should be such a thing as a Sola Scriptura model. And we'll get into that in future episodes, but, um, we've established the fact that there's all these different epistemic models in Christianity uh, in order to set up a criteria for evaluation. So if we're going to, as we're going to go through this, uh, to work with the implications of the Sola Scriptura model, we need to first decide how we're gonna evaluate this model. And in order to do this, we first need to establish certain parameters of viability, as opposed to just saying, okay, you know, whatever critic comes and says, I have a certain perspective and everybody that, that disagrees with me has to be wrong. Rather, we need to establish some parameters and then identify all the other models that fall within those parameters. So that way, when we do discuss the Sola Scriptura model, we're not evaluating it against some, some impossible standard, but we're evaluating the Sola Scriptura model against all the other viable models and the parameters of viability that we've established. So that way, the Sola Scriptura model, it might have strengths and it might have weaknesses, but the question is, does it have bigger weaknesses than, than all the other viable models or can it fall within the same parameters of viability and then be accepted as a viable model in the others? So uh, this, this gives us some sort of, uh, some criteria so that as we as we discuss the the Sola Scriptura model over the next few episodes, uh, it will help to kind of give us a direction on how to think about it, how to decide, you know, what areas are correct, what areas are bad, what needs to be improved, and so on. All right. So in the next episode, before we get into the Sola Scriptura model, I'm first going to specifically identify the various, or at least the more popular epistemic models within the Christian uh, religion, and then discuss why those models exist, how they came to exist, and, and uh, various aspects of them.